Well, if you have your Bibles, you can open to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be in Ephesians chapter 2 this evening, looking at verses 8 to 10. And since verses 8 to 10 are part of the main section that Paul is putting together in verses 1 to 10, we'll read the first 10 verses together. The Apostle Paul writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us, In Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. I think we would all agree that none of us appreciates when we don't get credit for something that we think we should get credit for. So imagine that you're at your job, perhaps you don't have to imagine, maybe this is a real life scenario for you, and you work really hard, you feel like you've contributed some major element to a very important uh, project at the workplace, or maybe you're at home, maybe you're a mother at home, and you have worked all day long to clean the house, scrubbing the toilets and the sinks, and vacuuming the rugs, all while juggling multiple children, all in order to host for the weekend. Or imagine that you've you've gone out of your way to show some act of kindness, some act of love to someone in need, and it's been at some degree of cost to yourself, perhaps great cost to yourself. And after that, after all of that, no one says anything. There's no recognition of it, there's no thank you, there's no acknowledgement. It's almost as if no one has noticed what you've gone through in order to do that. And that kind of thing eats us up, doesn't it? And usually in those situations, we try to drop little hints like, you know, we won't explicitly say, you should be recognizing how good the thing I've done is, but we'll drop little hints to kind of say, hey, by the way, did you notice what I did? And when we don't, frustration builds, tension builds, and that's usually, uh, unfortunately, when arguments happen. We do not like not getting credit when we think we deserve it. The passage that we have in front of us has to do with someone getting credit, but it has nothing to do with us getting credit. The passage that we're looking at in Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10 are not about us getting credit for something that we have done. Verses 8 to 10 of Ephesians chapter 2 are all about, in their entirety, they are all about God getting credit for what God alone has done. God alone deserves the credit for all of our salvation. That's really the theme of verses 8 to 10 in this chapter of Ephesians. I've entitled the sermon for this evening, taking it straight from the text, that no one may boast, that no one may boast. And that really lies at the heart of what Paul is saying in Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 10. He's saying your salvation from beginning to end is all the work of God, not as a result of anything you've done, and therefore no one may boast. There is no place for us receiving any of the credit at all, for any aspect of our salvation. That's Paul's point, that no one may boast. 
And we'll break this passage down, these, these three verses, into just two sections. We'll look at verses 8 to 9, saved by grace. Verses 8 to 9, saved by grace. Verse 10, recreated for works. Recreated for works. Not we created, but recreated with an R. Recreated for works. So verses 8 and 9, saved by grace. Verse 10, recreated for works. If you want to work that out a little more fully, that's the really brief version, so you can keep it in your notes. Saved by grace, recreated for works. That's easy enough. If you want to expand that a little bit, it would be none of us has any right to boast because one, our salvation is all of grace, not of works, and two, none of us has any reason to boast because we are his workmanship, recreated by him for good works. So that's the, the main thrust of the passage, and I hope uh, the sermon as well for us this evening. The goal for the sermon would be for us to walk away, if we are in Christ, with a, on the one hand, a deep sense of comfort. What grace God has lavished on us. I, I want us to walk away with that, first of all. What grace God has lavished on us, that he would rescue us from our sins and do absolutely everything required from beginning to end to bring us safely home to himself. What grace God has lavished on us. But then obviously the, the main point is how humble we ought to be if this is true. How humble we ought to be. How, how much, I would, I would argue, we need to grow in humility. If we've contributed nothing to our salvation, then we can boast of nothing. And when that's our foundation, it not only affects our vertical relationship with the Lord, humility before Him, but it absolutely affects our horizontal relationship with one another. If we have received immeasurable grace apart from anything that we have done, then should we not be prone to show large measures of grace, large measures of compassion and mercy and forgiveness to one another. So the first point, saved by grace. There's no room for boasting because we were saved by grace, not by works. Verses 8 to 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Saved by grace. Grace, uh, it goes without saying, is a very familiar word to us, uh, perhaps uh, in, in, a, in an unhelpful way, an overly familiar word to us. And I think even the definition of grace is very familiar to us. If you hear the word grace, what is the quick definition you probably give to it? Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. We hear that often. And that's right. That is a good definition of grace. Grace is favor, kindness, goodness given to us that we don't deserve. It's unmerited favor. But that definition doesn't go nearly far enough when it comes to God's grace toward us. God's grace toward us is not merely unmerited favor, because that leaves room for neutrality. We haven't done anything to earn his favor. But God's grace goes further than that. It's, it's not just favor to those who don't deserve it. It's the greatest favor, the most immeasurable favor and love and kindness given to those who deserve the very opposite of that, his wrath, his punishment, hell, condemnation. It is God pouring out the greatest riches of grace, of kindness, on those who are most deserving of his wrath. And so the definition needs to be expanded a bit, not just unmerited favor, but the greatest favor given to the greatest sinners. I want to jump over to Romans chapter 5. If you were here for the prayer meeting uh, earlier this afternoon, John alluded to this passage. I can't recall if he read it explicitly, but he alluded to it in his explanation of mercy. And it's worth going there again because I think it provides us with a good picture of grace. Romans chapter 5, look at verses 6 to 8. These are verses I assume are, are known to many of us. Romans 5, beginning in verse 6, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, 
though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the argument that Paul is making there is fairly straightforward. He's saying, let's, let's say you have a righteous man. It's very unlikely that someone would die for another man, even a righteous man. But he makes an exception. Okay, perhaps in some scenario, someone would be di- willing to die for, for a righteous man if he's a good man. But, but if, if we're talking about an unrighteous man, a sinner, I mean, if it's, if it's very unlikely that someone would die for a righteous man, then it is impossible that someone would die for the unrighteous man, for the, for the sinner. That would be un, unheard of, unthinkable. And at the risk of oversimplification, I'm going to explain a scenario. It provides some flesh to this picture. So imagine that there's a rural community, a small town, some couple hundred years ago. And in this small town, there is a righteous man, a good man. He's a good father. He's a good husband. He does good to the other people in the community. He cares for other people. He's generous. He's kind. He protects others. He is respected. He's admired. He's noble. He's recognized as a good man among that community. And then imagine, for whatever reason, that community is raided and slave traders come in and they capture this man in particular, and they're preparing to lead him out of the town, tied up and bound towards slavery and to a particular island where death is almost certain. And as the townspeople watch this good man being led out of the town, they're faced with a decision, or at least the potential decision. Should we, should we do anything about this? Should one of us step in and take his place? I mean, this is a noble man. If anyone here doesn't deserve to die, it's that man. And, and what Paul is saying is in that scenario, perhaps, it's very unlikely, but perhaps someone would say, okay, I'll take your place as a slave. I will be led to slavery and toward ultimate death for this good man because he's good, because he's righteous. That's what Paul is saying. That perhaps that might happen. But imagine an opposite scenario where this man who's being led astray is not a good man, is not a righteous man, but he's a wicked man. In fact, he is the most wicked man in the whole community, in the whole country. He has mistreated women. He has murdered men, women, and children. He has stolen property, vandalized property. He is a self-consumed, self-absorbed, lust-impassioned person who cares about no one but himself. In fact, his absence from the community would be praised by the people. They, they would see him being led out of this town, and they would likely applaud and say, yes, finally we're delivered from this wicked man. That's what we would expect in that scenario. Is as this man is being led away, this wicked, sinful man, we would expect the townspeople to say, great, one less thing to worry about. What Paul is saying is what we would never expect, what is beyond our ability to fathom, would be for someone to say, even for that man, I will die. I will take his place. I'll take the place of the most wicked man, of the most deserving of death. That man deserves misery. That man deserves slavery. That man deserves death. But I will step in, and I'll take his place. What Paul is saying is we would never expect that, perhaps in the case of a righteous man, but never in the case of a wicked man. But what he's saying is it's that very unthinkable, or to use Sean's reference, scandalous grace, scandalous love that Christ has shown toward us. He died for the most wicked. He he died for the people that apart from his salvation, heaven would applaud as they went on their way toward hell because they were receiving the just penalty for their sin and the justice of God was being rightly displayed in their condemnation. That's the kind of people Christ died for. That's the kind of people we are by nature, sinners deserving of the most miserable condemnation. And yet he says, We see God's love for us in this, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in that very 
condition. Christ died for us. When we're in Ephesians 2, verse 8, and we read, For by grace you have been saved. That's what we need to picture. We, that miserable sinner, being led out of the village on our way toward condemnation, we were those miserable sinners. And yet, by grace, Christ intervened. And he took your place. And he died for you. And he redeemed you. And he saved you. By grace. And that's what we saw last week. So if you remember to last week, you remember that there is a trajectory that takes place in Ephesians chapter 2. Where it all started, where it all changed, where it's all headed. It all started, verses 1 to 3, in our sin. So back in Ephesians 2 now. Where did our life start? Well, it started in our sin, in our death, spiritually. He says we... He always says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were dead. You walked. The entire course of your life was carried out in trespasses and sins. He says you you walked not just in your trespasses and sins, but you walked according to the course of this world and its hostility against God. You walked in the influence and under the influence of Satan, the prince prince of the power of the air. And you walked after the course and the Uh, the lusts of your sinful flesh. That's what we were by nature. And as a result, children of wrath, he says. That's where it all started, but then it all changed, he says. He says, even when we were in that condition, verse 4 of Ephesians 2, even in verse 5, even when we were dead, even when we were lost, enemies of God, having nothing in us to provoke his love, We read, God loved us. He had mercy on us, being rich in mercy toward us. Terrible, obstinate, rebellious sinners toward us. He had mercy. And he had mercy because he loved us. He looked on us with love. And out of love, his heart was moved to compassion and mercy. And his mercy and compassion led to him redeeming us, rescuing us out of our sin. By grace, you have been saved. That's the only explanation for it. It's all of grace. Those who are dead in their sins and trespasses have done nothing to awaken the favor, love, and kindness of God. He is a God of grace. He looks on undeserving men and women like you and I, and he is gracious. We are saved by grace. But then Paul says, not only are we saved by grace— But this grace by which we're saved, it's directly connected to faith in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So the fact that we are saved by faith adds support to this gracious nature of salvation. So how do we know that salvation is of grace? Well, because salvation is through faith. What's the connection? Why does faith necessarily mean that salvation is by grace? What argument is is Paul making there? What's the connection between our faith and God's grace? What he's saying, absolutely, is that faith is not a work. So faith is not the cause of our salvation. It's not as though God looks on our faith and sees it and is pleased with the quality of our faith and therefore decides to save us. That's not what he does. Faith is the instrument by which he makes us alive. Let me give an illustration. Let's say that I have some terrible allergy. Or let's say I get bit by a spider in the jungle. And this is a deadly poisonous spider. And suddenly my arm starts to swell up. And I know I need to get to the hospital as quick as I can. And I need one particular shot, whatever that might be, at the hospital. And so I I get to the hospital. And they give me the shot. And the swelling goes down. And I'm just fine. And I go home. And I tell my family, don't worry. I'm okay. They put this metal needle in me, and the metal, it saved my life. Of course, that's not accurate. It's not the metal that saved my life. It was the medicine. The medicine that they gave me that went into my blood system, I guess is how it works, that's what saved me. That's what saved my life, not the needle. And and the same is true of saving faith. We don't look at our faith and we say, our faith is what saves our life. We look at Christ 
and we say, he died for me, and he lives for me, and faith is merely the means by which I receive it because faith looks to him. And so you see the difference. Faith is not the grounds of our salvation. It's not the basis of our salvation. Faith is the empty hand stretched out to God to receive the free gift of salvation. No one can claim I'm saved because of my faith. We can say I'm saved by my faith, through my faith, if we mean the means by which we're saved, but we can only say we're saved by Christ. And this should be a great encouragement to us because if that's the case, then the assurance, the safety, the security of our salvation doesn't rest on the strength of the needle, the faith. It rests on the strength of the medicine, the Savior. It really doesn't matter what needle is used to get that medicine into your arm, as long as it's a needle. And our faith may be weak at times, and we may struggle at times with faith. But if our faith has been placed in a mighty Savior, then we are looking to Christ, and he is our Savior, despite the weakness at times of our faith. And so faith is not a work by which we're saved. It is directly connected to grace. It is merely the act of receiving his grace freely through an outstretched, empty hand. Which is why Paul says that not of yourselves, it is the gift of of God. So if you think about it, what, what Paul is saying is that even the faith that stretches its hand out to freely receive the gift of God in Christ is itself a gift. He says that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And there's, you know, that word that, everyone see that in verse 9? Uh, actually, is that verse 8? Yeah, that is verse 8 after the semicolon. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, everyone see that? That not of yourselves. That pronoun is neuter. And if you've ever learned Latin or Greek, um, then you know that there are certain words that are masculine, there are certain words that are feminine, and there are other words that are neuter. This is a neuter pronoun. The problem is grace is feminine, and faith is, is feminine, but this pronoun is neuter. So the question is, how does a neuter pronoun refer back to a feminine noun, grace, or faith? And because it can't. Usually that's very rare. Uh, anyone speak Spanish? Who speaks Spanish or had Spanish classes? Can you say el niña? Doesn't make sense, right? It's backwards. Can you say uh, la papa? No, it's backwards. It's a feminine pronoun, a feminine article with a masculine, pronoun, or a masculine noun. It doesn't work. That's what Paul is doing here. Feminine nouns, grace and faith, with a masculine pronoun. And so the question is, what's he referring to when he says that? That is not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. What's the gift of God? Well, the neuter can refer to the whole package. Everything that he said in the first part of verse 8. By grace you have been saved through faith. This whole package of salvation is all not of your own doing. All of it is the gift of God. Whether it's the salvation, the saving, whether it's the grace, whether it's the faith, everything pertaining to this package of salvation is the gift of God, not of yourself. You've not produced it. You're not responsible for it. It's not caused by you. It is caused by God. He has loved you. He has saved you by his grace. And so faith then, it's the very opposite of works, he says. This gift of salvation that comes to us through faith, it's the very opposite of works, not as a result of works. And then he says the result is so that no one may boast. Faith is an empty hand. There's no works in it. There, there's nothing in my hands that I bring to Christ. Faith is empty-handed looking to the Savior for him to come and to rescue us. And so it's not a work. It's actually a forsaking of all of our works. Faith is a turning away from all confidence in ourselves. It is a turning away from all confidence in anything other than Jesus. It is a looking to Christ as the sole source of our hope because of his finished work for us on the cross and his ongoing work for us as Savior. And so the first thing Paul would have us see then, I think, is that there's no boasting in the Christian life. There is 
no room for boasting, because salvation from beginning to end is all of grace. It's all of God. And then secondly, there's no boasting in the Christian life because we're recreated for works. He made us. He recreated us. We are his workmanship. And the good works that we perform are not even the result of our own strength. They're the result of his work in us. I think that's what we see in verse 10. There's no boasting in the Christian life, for we are his workmanship, verse 10. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So maybe in verses 8 to 9, maybe after hearing that, someone could argue, okay, I, I, I understand the initial element of salvation being of grace. I understand that I was dead in my sins and my trespasses, and I understand that God made me alive and that it was by his grace that I believed and that I was saved. I, I understand that much, and I understand why there's no boasting as a result of that. But doesn't the Bible clearly speak of my responsibility to do good works as a believer? And isn't there some sense in which I am responsible for my good works as a believer? And if that's the case, isn't there some sense, perhaps we wouldn't argue this way, but isn't there some sense in which I am to be given some credit for my good works, my sanctification? And I think what Paul would have us see in in verse 10 is that boasting is not only removed initially at conversion, but boasting is removed throughout the entire course of our Christian life because even the good works that we do are the works he produces in us. Or to put it another way, yes, we do have the responsibility to do good works. Yes, we have the responsibility to strive after holiness, to seek the face of God, to be obedient, to obey his commandments. Yes, we have that responsibility, that calling on our life But even our working and our doing is the result of God's working and God's doing in us. We're his workmanship. I think that's the idea that Paul has in Philippians chapter 2, where you can jump back there. It's just one verse, uh, General Electric Power Company, one book, one verse toward the back of your Bible. In Philippians chapter 2, in verses 12 and 13, He says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul says, Work, be diligent to obey, just as you've always obeyed. Keep working, keep striving, keep pressing on to be like Christ. Seek after holiness. Work. But even as you do that, recognize that it is God who is at work in you. Not just to give you the the strength to, to do what you want to do, but even the desire itself is produced in you by God. It is God who works in you both to will, both to desire, and to do, to accomplish. The desire and the accomplishment are God's working in you as you strive to walk in obedience to him. Work out your salvation, Paul says, in the confidence of knowing that you don't do it on your own. You do it in the strength which God supplies and the works which he produces in you and through you. I think that's what Paul's saying in verse 10. We are his workmanship. As his workmanship, we've been created for good deeds. Those good deeds are the result of his work in us and not the result of our own efforts and strengths apart from him. He calls us his workmanship, his workmanship. That noun, workmanship, carries the idea of a work of art, a masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece, you could say. And if that sounds like a stretch, then it's helpful to see that it's the same word that the Apostle Paul uses in chapter 1 of Romans, where he's speaking about the glory of God being known, or his divine attributes being known, ever since the foundation of the world, through creation. Uh, I butchered that. So let's go to Romans chapter 1. And Paul will be more helpful than my paraphrase. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. 
He says, for since the creation, that's the same word, since the creation of the world, the masterpiece, the work of art, that is creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness are without excuse. What's Paul saying there? He's saying that in God's creation, his glory is so displayed that unbelievers have to suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They have to force themselves to deny his existence because his glory is so clearly seen in the things that he's made. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal nature, his divine power, his beauty, his splendor, they're revealed in the works of creation. That's what Psalm 19 tells us when it talks about the heavens telling or declaring the glory of God. What God has made declares his glory. Okay, so what's the connection then to Ephesians chapter 2? It's the only other time that that word is used in the New Testament, this word for creation or workmanship. So what is Paul trying to say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, when he says that we are God's workmanship? Well, what he's saying is that in the same way that the original creation of all the heavens and the earth declare the glory of God, proclaim his beauty and his glory and his eternal nature, in that same way, he has created us to be his masterpiece, to be a reflection of his creative power, his divine love, his saving ability, his beauty, his glory, his grace. He has created us as his creation, his new creation to be a display of his glory, just as the original creation was. And this is a new creation that he's referring to in verse 8. He says, created in Christ Jesus. So we are God's masterpiece, his work of art, in order to display the glory of God. And how are we God's masterpiece? Because he has recreated us in Christ. He has created you anew in Jesus. What Paul's talking about here is what happens when you're united to Jesus. When Jesus rose from the dead, in a a very real sense, in a biblical sense, a new age began. A new era began. A new creation was started by his resurrection. And as he sits enthroned in the heavens, he is ruling very much as the king of this earth, but also the king of the new creation. And we as believers, we're waiting, in fact, we are longing for the consummation of the new creation. It's been started through his resurrection. We live in this period of time in which we are longing for and waiting for him to come and bring in its fullness the consummation of this new creation by renewing the whole world, the heavens and the earth. But what Paul is saying is that when we're united to Christ, we are spiritually transferred into that new creation. We no longer live in the old realm where sin and death and Satan reign. Satan is called the ruler of this world, the God of this world, the ruler of this age. We are transferred out of that age. We are transferred into this new creation spiritually. We are given a new nature. He refashions us. He recreates us from the heart, in the heart, from the inside. Obviously, we're not fully delivered yet. We still wrestle against the flesh and against sin. But in a very real sense, in a very present sense, if you are a believer united to Christ, in the moment you are united to Christ, he brings you into this new realm of existence and he makes you new. He gives you a new heart, new desires. And what Paul is saying is that when that happens, God's glory, his beauty, begins to be displayed in your life. You become his masterpiece a picture of his creative power, his recreative power, not just taking something out of nothing and creating something, but taking something that is rotten and defiled by sin and making it holy and righteous and beautiful. That's what he does. And when he does that, he is putting on display for all to see his glory. And how is that glory seen in our lives? Well, he says we're his workmanship. We're created to show his craftiness, his Uh, That's not a good word. His creativity, his power. And how do we do that? By good works, which he prepared for us to, to walk in. So how is God's glory seen in his new creatures? They walk 
in good works. This theme of walking, uh, if you'll remember, it's the theme of the second half of Ephesians. So Paul will begin talking in chapter 4 of this new walk that we have in Christ, what it looks like to walk as a believer. Therefore, verse 1 of chapter 4, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And then for the last three chapters, Paul explains what that walk looks like. Here he just says, you were called to walk in good deeds in verse 10 of chapter 2. He doesn't get into detail of what those good deeds are. We will at some point in the future. But the point is, those deeds, which we'll go on later to explain, these fruits of righteousness in our life, those things are the necessary consequence of his recreative power in us. There are certain things that we expect based on the laws of physics. If you put a needle to a balloon, what's going to happen? The balloon is going to pop. If you put a pot of hot water on a very hot stovetop, what's going to happen over time? It's going to boil. Uh, what's, I don't know. You get the picture. Things happen just like we would expect them to happen. When God recreates a heart, we expect good deeds to follow. Why? Well, if it were up to us, if it were our power, our strength, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see good deeds follow. God tells us in Romans chapter 8 that he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, God's purpose for your life, even before you existed, was for him to make you like Christ, to cause you to walk in likeness to his son. Will God leave that up to chance in your life? Does he save you and just kind of throw up his hands and say, well, I hope this one that I've saved walks in good deeds? I hope that in the end they're conformed to the image of Christ. No, that's not at all what happens. We're, we're told in, in Philippians that it's him, God himself, who is at work perfecting us, making us conform to the image of his son. Or there's the Old Testament promise of Ezekiel, chapter 36, where God says this, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinance, my ordinances. I will put my spirit within you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. In other words, he's not leaving it up to you. In a sense, he is, but on a foundational level, he's not. He's not leaving it up to you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You will be careful to observe my ordinances. In other words, when God saves us, he recreates us, and he sets us on this trajectory of good works. And Paul says that he prepared beforehand for us to walk in them. In other words, they are so much not the result of us that God had prepared them before we even existed. Your works that you do are so independent of your own creative power that you didn't even create the idea of them. God has fashioned your life in such a way he has set the good works before you in such a way that it perfectly conforms to his desire to set you on this path of obedience in a way that will perfectly magnify his creative, gracious power in your life. Now, if you think about that for a second, that makes our very unglamorous lives a bit more glamorous, doesn't it? To think that God has placed you exactly where he has placed you in life. He has given you the particular vocation, whatever that is, job, wife, husband, child, student, whatever friends, whatever family he's placed you in, wherever you are in life, God has placed you there, at least in this particular moment, for the purpose of perfectly displaying his glory through you. If he wanted you to be somewhere else, he would have mapped out those works before you lived. But he wanted you right where you are. And so he has placed you right where you are, and he has prepared the works that you are performing before you even lived. And as we perform them, which we're responsible to do, and this is mysterious, it does go beyond what we're fully able to wrap our minds around, but we do have the responsibility to walk in obedience. When we don't, there's no one to blame but ourselves for not leaning on the grace and the strength which God provides. But as we walk day after day in obedience in the particular context in which God places us, we look back on every single one of those acts of obedience, and we say, it was the grace of God. That was God. That was his power. That was his strength. 
He enabled me to be patient and kind and humble. He enabled me to be courageous when I was afraid. He enabled me to open my mouth and speak when I would rather not. It was all of God. It was all of his grace. We are his workmanship, created by him for the good deeds which he prepared beforehand for us to walk in and which he empowers us to fulfill. It is all of grace, all of God, and so there is no room for boasting. Chapter 2, verse 1 and through verse 3 begins, as I've mentioned, in a very bad place. It ends in a very different place. First three verses are us walking in trespasses and sins. Verse 10 is us walking in good deeds which display the recreative power of God in our lives. What a transformation God has brought about in our lives that we would go from dead in our sins, walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, according to the lusts and passions of our flesh, that we would go from that kind of life to a life where I can now say, I want to live according to God's commands, and he enables me to do it. He gives me the strength that I need. He has prepared the works for me to walk in, and I get to wake up tomorrow, and you get to wake up tomorrow, without it being an overstatement to say, I am excited for whatever works God has placed in front of me today. They may be miserable circumstances. They may be challenging, but they are the very works that God has placed before you in order for you to magnify his grace and his glory. What a great and amazing privilege we've been given to go from dead in sin to being displays and masterpieces of the grace of God. We could end by quoting the Apostle Paul, For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Do you find in yourself a boasting heart? And perhaps you would say, no. But how do you respond to others when you don't feel like you're treated fairly? Because when we don't respond to others with grace, it's evidence in our hearts that we've not yet grasped the grace that we've received. When we're not quick to show grace to others, it's because we have failed to understand at a foundational level that our complete existence as Christians is owed to the pure grace of God. So do you find boasting in your own heart? How do you respond to those around you when they don't give you credit the way you think you should receive it? How do you respond to those around you when they don't behave the way you think they should behave? How do you respond to your husband, to your wife, to your children, to your boss, to your coworkers when they disappoint you? Are you quick to show grace, the same kind of grace that you've been shown in Christ? What do you have that you have not received? If you did receive it, why do you boast? There's no room for boasting in the Christian life, unless it's the kind of boasting Paul talks about in Galatians. May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're going to boast in something, which you should, don't boast in yourself, don't boast in your efforts, don't boast in your accomplishments. Boast in the accomplishment of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is our only hope and our only sure foundation. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word, and we do thank you that it shows us so often how wrong our thinking can be, how prone we are to take credit away from you and give it to ourselves. We thank you, Father, that you have not waited for us to clean up our lives, to get better, and to come to you, but you found us even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and you made us alive, and it was all of grace. And we thank you, Father, that you have laid out before us, mapped out in front of us the good deeds which you desire us to walk in, and we trust God, that in mapping them out, you also enable us and strengthen us to do all that you have set before us. We pray, Lord, that you would make us humble people. We have need of humbling. We pray that you would show us the riches of your grace day after day as we look to Christ. We pray that our lives would be a good reflection of the grace of Jesus. We pray that you would help us to live for you this week, Lord, as we leave here. Help us to go into the world eager to fulfill those works which you have set before us. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.